All right. Um, I think that everything is in line, so why don't we go ahead and get started. Uh, just a few minutes early um, than normal, um, uh, but let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord's blessing on um, our study, or our continued study here, and uh, um, to, to enjoy the next hour. Father, I just really um, am so blessed by your word. I'm so blessed by the way that you unfold it for us, that you reward um, when we go searching for diamonds, when we go searching for jewels, that you, there, it's never, you, ne you never disappoint. They're always there. Um, and you may reveal them in varying stages and varying degrees for us, but nonetheless, we are truly blessed. And I pray that um, uh, the, the points that uh, were made this morning would be points that would be uh, uh, just resounding in, in our ears and our, our minds and in our hearts as we leave this place later on today. We'll give you the glory and thank you for the time that we have together in Christ's name. Amen. Um, amen, amen, amen. Let me, um, before we get started, let me share some things um, with you. You know, as, as Sonia is out there, poor thing, she's, she's burning her, the back of her throat. I can see the pain in her face as she's uh, wolfing down her coffee. <laughs> you know, if I was a nicer person, you know what I would, I would say, I'll bring it in, you know. But I'm not really that nice. I just enjoy watching her scarf it down. <laughs> Um, there's a, an oddity, and I know that none of you will really appreciate this or think it to be true, but I have this fear that I've had ever since I first started preaching of not having enough to preach about. <laughs> I know, I know, it seems silly, but when I'm looking at things, when I'm, I'm, I'm sizing them up, Last week, um, when I'm looking at, at my understanding of the, the, the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin, and I was, the way I was looking at it last week, it was like, oh my goodness, we, we, we're going to cover that. I almost tacked the lost coin in, on the end of last week's sermon. And part of the reason was, oh man, we're going to get there. I'm not going to have, you know, they're all going to feel cheated if I only give them a 20-minute um, sermon, you, you know. Um, and, and you all say, no, it's okay. Anytime you want to give me a, a 20 minute, do so. But nonetheless, it, it never fails when you take a passage that you thought was, I, I thought I had it down. I, I thought that the focus of this particular passage was um, to, to uh, uh, emphasize the three major points of the parable that came before it. Almost like Jesus is saying, okay, here's the parable. Here's the application. Now let me let me make a simpler presentation of it, and let me point out the things that were important in that main parable. All of this leading up to the really main parable, which is the parable of the uh, of the prodigal son. But that's not the case, is it? Uh, he rewards, I think, when we are willing to take shorter, smaller segments of scripture and to delve into it more deeply, I did not realize that um, there was such a beautiful imagery here. I, I, I didn't realize uh, of the whole redemptive um, plan. Um, so I, 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 I just thought I'd share that with you that it, it almost got tacked on to the end of the sermon last week instead of uh, coming into this week. I'll tell you something else I was not, and, and you can tell me if you are fully aware. You know, you know how you're aware of things because you, you know it, but you're not really aware of it. You're not, you, you don't really comprehend it that way. Now, we talk about the perfect life of Jesus all the time, and we talk about his perfect righteousness all the time. And we talk about the fact that without that perfect righteousness, which 
theologians call the impeccability. It's the doctrine of impeccability, which means the doctrine of the fact that Jesus was sinless. He lived a perfect life, and we have Hebrews and other passages that we go to. But it never crossed my mind the way that it did this week that what we are seeing in Jesus is the imago Dei, perfected. That, you know, we, we talk about the loss of the Imago Dei. It usually is all in the context of what Adam and Eve lost. But the fact that the Imago Dei was walking around on this earth, and really it was that question of Dr. Sproul's that put it into context for me. When it's, okay, what is there about Jesus that the church has lost? What is it that we no longer have that was drawing all of these people like moths to a flame to Jesus and they're not being drawn. In fact, they're being repelled by, by the church. Why, why is that? And, and that's what got me to thinking, well, Jesus was the Imago Dei. Jesus is the actual image. And yes, we know he is God in the flesh. Yes, we know that. We know that he's the radiance of God's glory. We know that in him the fullness of the deity was pleased to dwell. We understand that. Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. We, we, we understand all that about Jesus, but did, do we understand that the reason that Satan hates Jesus so much, one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons that the Pharisees hate Jesus so much is because he's the walking, talking image of God. He is God in the flesh. He's the Imago Dei. And that when we stand before God, our Imago Dei will be restored. But not ours. It's his that we will have that will be the untarnished version of the Imago Dei. Does everybody get that point? Having four, five, five, right? So how is that different from being restored to the image of God? And then the other question I had is, what exactly is the image of God? When God created man in the image of himself, what, what, what does that mean? I, uh, and I, I have these little cute phrases that I, I'm, I'm going to key on, and then I get up there and I completely forget them. You know? <laughs> um, and, and one of those cute phrases was that when we start looking at our sanctification, okay, our becoming more and more like Jesus and ultimately glorified, well, the way I put that is the practicality of the Imago Dei has got to run to catch up with the soteriology of the Imago Dei. Now, of course, that I love to say those things because nobody knows what I'm saying. All right, yeah, no, nobody knows what, what it means, so I, I get to explain it, right? Okay, so I'm saved at 39. My soul is completely changed. I have a new soul, a, a new heart we, we, we use that's a worthy receptacle for the Holy Spirit. It's redeemed, but it still lives in a fallen, sinful body. So almost instantly, there's an internal conflict between my redeemed soul, my redeemed self, if you want to look at it that way, and my fallen self. So a process of sanctification begins, okay? That's practically, that's the work of sanctification leading towards glorification, which is where we'll be in heaven, okay? Now, we will have the Imago Dei restored my Imago Dei, what God made me in his image, and I tarnished it, I sinned, and it was, but, but then through the process of glorification, that Imago Dei will be restored. Now, soteriologically, talking about the redemptive work of Jesus and the saving work of Jesus, well, when Jesus saves me, Boom, just like I have his righteousness, I have his Imago Dei. It is his image that I will have imputed to me, declared to me when I stand before a perfect and a holy God. He will see Christ's righteousness, not my own. Because you see, I have a righteousness 
that now is a glorified body. I no longer have a sinful body, but I'm still a sinner. I'm a redeemed sinner. I'm a forgiven sinner, but I'm still, I still have a history of sin in my life. I'm not a perfect sacrifice. I'm not pure. And only pure things are going to stand in the presence of God. Okay? And so therefore, it's not my righteousness. As good as it is then, I'm glorified. I've got no sin in my life anymore. But it's still not my righteousness. Because my righteousness is not good enough. Because I've got a history of sin behind it. I was forgiven by the grace of God. Not on my own merit. But I'm still not perfect, sinless. Not the perfect Imago Dei that he created in Adam and Eve in the garden. You see, that's why when we talk about returning to the garden, and I do that all the time, I talk about returning to the garden, it needs to be qualified. Because yes, we return to the garden, but not entirely, because we've sinned in the process, and Adam and Eve had no sin. They were in God's image without sin. And so when in our, in our own lives, our own righteousness, we have to run to catch up with what Christ has accomplished for us with his righteousness. On the one hand, he forgives us. We keep on sinning, but we keep getting better and better and better until we're glorified, our sinfulness is gone. But on the other hand, we're already redeemed. If we were to die today, long before our process of sanctification is anywhere near a, a, a point, we still have the imputed image of God because of Christ. That's why Jesus is absolutely necessary. He, we cannot stand before God without his righteousness, his perfect righteousness. That's the whole reason he was born as a baby. That's the whole reason for his life growing up. Because he had to be the perfect righteousness. He had to be the image that God intended when he made Adam and Eve. I know that's a little head heady, but that's... Jesus was 100% God. He was like, does that mean that God looks like us? Or obviously not, because he's way more than that. Well, but the image of God has nothing to do with appearance. Okay? It, it has everything to do with the attributes. If you go back and you study the attributes of God, which is what we're trying to do in the DR if they ever let us in, okay, is to study the attributes. There are non-communicable attributes and there are communicable attributes, meaning there are things that are only God and not us. Infinity, eternality, omnipotence, omniscience, the, the whole, those are all things that are peculiar to God and God alone. But there are many other things that he gave us, the ability to reason, the ability to love, to have emotions, the moral heart, the idea of a conscience, to have a will, to have volition that, we, that we, we, we have. All of these things are what it means to be made in the image of God. To have the ability to sin is also something that God left in us. It's not part of that image. I'm, I'm sorry, let me back that up. The ability is something that God created, the ability to sin. He doesn't have that ability because of his perfectness. But when that is brought to us, we are given that option, that opportunity, because it was important for God that if we were to remain true to him, that we would remain true. Yes, ma'am. Resurrected, resurre resurrected with Christ because he is in us, and he was resurrected in us. Now we are able to be resurrected. Is that when God recognizes the, um, the, 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 yeah. the image of God? Um, yeah, that's just, that, uh, that's, you know, if, if some people say, well, then why don't you just say image of God? Um, and the only reason I don't, the only reason I don't is because I want you to recognize that term. Because if you're reading through something sometime and they just, they just say the Imago Dei, then that's such an important theological term I want you to know that. So that's the reason I keep keep hitting, and not just to impress you, uh, but yeah, yeah uh, you know, just so you, that you know. Because, like for instance, you go to the Ligonier site and read anything Dr. Froll talks about. He's not going to say image of God. He's going to say Imago Dei, and 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 all of this comes uh, in in with that. So um, yes, we will be resurrected with Christ. But that's what I, that's what that's what I I talk about. Okay, the 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 idea of salvation. 
is, is more complex than something that we can take linearly. Even the idea of sanctification. There are places in the New Testament where sanctification is referred to in a perfect tense. Something that is complete. And in a sense, it has been completed. Because our sanctification is through the work of the Holy Spirit because of Christ. So in other words, there's no way that that's not going to turn out to be the way that it intends to be. So the, 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 there's a process of sanctification that occurs through our entire life. But right back here, at the time of conversion, when our sins are forgiven, when we are justified, and the righteousness of Christ is declared, we are declared righteous now. We're not righteous, but we're declared righteous. Well, that right there is when the image of Christ is, image of God is restored. The Imago Dei is restored in a soteriological sense, in the redemptive sense, in the theological sense, if you want to. It doesn't take place in you practically until you're glorified. And the glorification, yes, you are resurrected to a newness of life with Christ. Okay. Now, again, what are we talking about resurrection? Are we talking about physical resurrection? Does that mean that you're in a non-glorified uh, state until the physical resurrection? You know, when we actually are resurrected, our bodies are reunited with our souls. When does that happen? How does that happen? Or is there even a timeline for that? I can't tell you. I don't know. You know, yeah, we, we, we don't want to get too clever uh, uh, about how, how that works. But the, 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 the hard thing for us to comprehend is that in one sense, we are already declared perfect and righteous in Christ. We're already declared because it's not our righteousness, it's his. So in that sense, we're righteous. But in a practical, everyday sense, you look at yourself and say, no, that's not me. And some people get confused with this. They, they hear things about we're righteous in Christ, and then they wake up and they say, well, that's not me. I must not be saved. Well, no, that, that's where the, the process of sanctification, of growing more like Christ, continues day in and day out until we die, and we are glorified. Okay? That, that, I mean, that, that, that is what the end product, as far as me, is concerned. But what is so hard for us to do is that Okay, I was made in the image of God. You were made in the image of God, okay? When you were still in your mother's womb, that image was horribly corrupted, horribly twisted, horribly uh, tarnished, okay? But it's still there. It's still there to agree. You still have a dignity that comes from being made in the image of God. The worst sinner out there. The most egregious sinner still should have a degree of dignity because they are made in the image of God. Now, the unfortunate part about the rest of the culture is they want to talk about the dignity part, but they don't want to talk about the depravity part, that we are a tarnished, um, a, a corrupt version of that. Now, when you're saved, when Jesus, when you're born again, when the Holy Spirit regenerates you, okay? Instantly, from that point on, it's not like, okay, it depends on how better I get, whether or not I'm going to go to heaven or not. That's the Catholic idea. That's where purgatory comes in, right? It's you, salvation, it's grace, faith, plus works. That's not it. You are immediately, you're completely and totally saved. If you were to die the next second, that would be it. You would still go to heaven and you would be perfectly righteous. But your flesh is going to go through a process where you run to keep up with your redeemed self. And that's the Christian life, really. To try to keep up with my redeemed self because my redeemed self had been declared righteous by God. It is the Imago Dei of Christ. I'm not there yet. So I'm going to run the rest of my life and work hard the rest of my life to catch up with my, his Imago Dei. I'm going to catch up with the Imago Dei that has been declared mine by Christ because of my salvation, which happened when I believed in him and trusted in him 
and, and, and gave my life to him. Between being before God and when you're, when you're before God, it's the difference between him saying, oh, welcome, here you are, there you are, and I never knew you. Um, y yes, but I, I don't think you would ever get before God. You wouldn't get in the gates. Yeah, you, 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 you wouldn't be there. You wouldn't be able to. But, yeah, but it's not Peter at the, it's not Peter at the gate. You know, just remember that. It's not Peter. It, it's Christ, okay? Yeah, and, and he's the one who's going to look in your eyes and, 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 and do that. But, but hang on a second. Hold that thought. Let, let, me, let me just um, uh, re reiterate one thing. When you stand before God, okay, Scripture teaches us that God is so pure, so holy, as to not even be able to look upon iniquity. Okay, so there can be no iniquity in you to have a relationship with God. Now, what I think most people miss is that if I am redeemed and my sins are cleansed and they're expiated and propitiated and they're moved from me, I'm no longer, I am justified, meaning I am declared not guilty Right, I, I'm declared not guilty, but I still sinned. And how can I, with my history of sin forgiven by Jesus, how can I stand in front of a holy God? That's the whole reason for the righteousness of Christ. It's his righteousness. Perfect. Right. He's, he, he, he sees the, the blood of his son. Okay, sorry. Why do people think that Peter is the one that lets you into heaven? It's probably because of where Jesus gives him the, the keys to heaven. Right, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. So he's the gatekeeper and, and is wrapped up in Roman Catholicism um, and mysticism. That, you know, he's now the, the, the keeper of the keys. Um, right, or always has been the keeper of the keys. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> if, if you're witnessing to an atheist, yeah. You know, who believes we came from pond scum. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, <clears throat> you state that you were made in the image of God, and they say, in what way am I the image, do I bear the image of God? Do uh, you think, you know, telling him the fact that you have a conscience? That you can think and reason out problems. Right. The fact that you, you know, uh, have emotions right. and, uh, you know, other qualities right. are, uh, you know, which animals and all other living things. Right. How, how, how did you, I mean, the, the simple way to respond to that is, is, is if they say, um, okay, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? The simple thing is to say, what does two plus two equal? Four. There you have it. Simple as, as, as simple as you can possibly get it. What animal can you honestly say has the ability to reason that way, to do mathematical, to, to, to even think about whether or not there is a God or not? I mean, if you think about the fact that is there a God, that means that you have a reasoned mind. Now, there is no evidence whatsoever that any other creature, I mean, they can be trained to do things, but to do, to actually reason things out, to do things because they have a conscience. Animals have no conscience. They, they, they have no uh, 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 regrets over what they do. They don't do things, they don't, uh, they, they, they do things out of instinct, not through the volition of their own will. I mean, all these things are things that, are, are the image of God. And, 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 and I, you don't have to be a scientist. I mean, there have been plenty of people that are trying to prove that animals have this ability. You know, I, I, I read something in studying about the sheep that um, some woman said that sheep are actually the most brilliant of all creatures and nobody knows it. I don't think the I don't think the sheep knows it e either, you know. <laughs> but everybody has their, you know, they're trying to change the to to make their own point, 
And so, um, but uh, there, there's not a lot of uh, two plus two equals four um, in, in that ability to reason. The huge irony, the huge irony of this is that the only view of humanity that establishes dignity in humans is the Christian view, is the view of God created us in his image. Now, all these people who say they are humanist and hold humanity in such high regard at the same time are saying that I hold human, I exalt humanity by what I do, but I believe you came from pond scum. There's no dignity in you whatsoever. There's no depravity in you because there's no dignity because there is no morality in you. But yeah, wait a minute, I, I, I decide what's right and wrong. The culture decides what's right and wrong. So it, it's completely, it's baffling how irrational the thought actually is. How can something who's a cosmic accident have dignity? How is something, and the proof of the pudding is something like abortion. The proof of the pudding is that. It, it, when, when, when you, you, you can wholesale murder millions of, of children in the womb without a second thought about it and, and claim because you say it's a choice that somehow that makes it okay, the only reason is because there's no value on that life because that life came from pond scum, okay? Actually from two molecules who hit each other somehow in the vastness of space. So, th therefore, it doesn't make any sense. Not be consistent in your thinking. If you have no value, if you're a random accident, then you have no value here. You have no significance. But I came from nowhere, I'm going nowhere, but of all the creatures in the universe, my mind, Stephen Hawking's, is so brilliant that I'm going to tell you how the universe was created. I'm going to tell you, even though my mind came from inanimate matter. Really? You know? So it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, 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 behind you, Preston. Uh, yeah, uh, well, I got two. One, the first one is, what you, uh, this is how you say the image. Uh, in my day. Yeah, see, when I was in school, when I didn't understand, I just skip over and I still didn't ask the question. That's why we end up with C's and D's. You know? <laughs> so, uh, so you say that means the image of God. Right. Okay. All right, I've got it now. Now, the last one is the, the last one on your on your, uh, on your on your thing here. Uh, the necessity of repentance. And repentance is, is just changed, but then our whole life to the end is complete. It's always changing. We always change, right? Always repenting. Always, 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 always repenting, right? Uh, With, yeah. Now, uh, when Paul said, I don't know where it is, he said that I want to do right, right. but my, I guess my members will want to do something right. different. Right. So, uh, the, the, the thing so I want there's to do a war, there's a war always. Yeah. That's the war between a redeemed soul and a fleshly fallen body. The Holy Spirit is, uh, is continually changing us up. Well, according to what we read uh, last week in Philippians, it is a almost partnership between our working out our salvation in fear and trembling Okay, there's, there's a, a, a volition, proactiveness on the part of the Christian to want to, um, uh, to grow closer to Christ, to act more like Christ, and being facilitated by the Holy Spirit. Now, the picture we saw today is that the Holy Spirit, to a very large degree, uses the church to do that, as he is doing right now. This is a meeting, a gathering of the church where the Holy Spirit uses his word, our understanding of that word, to increase our understanding so we grow more like Christ. Okay? 
So that, that's, that, that's uh, uh, it, the Holy Spirit stays involved with it. But again, we're talking about the improvement of my fallen self, which will get better and better and better, more like Christ. But, and you know this as well as I do, that the more you advance towards Christ, the worse you look. So you never get to the point where you say, I'm getting better. Wow, look at me. You, you just get, uh, 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 my, my goodness, I, I can't believe how egregious and horrible my sins actually are. So the more light you see, the worse you look. So it's not like you start feeling, oh, I'm really feeling pretty good about myself now. You know that doesn't happen. You know that the closer we get to Christ, the more we recognize our own, uh, right, how bad we really were. Yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. What you were talking about before with, uh, with abortion and, and how people are horrified when you talk about the animal abuse and all that and what's going on with the climate and waters and all yet they're not horrified at the killing of children. Right. Is that I can Well, but well first of all, well, and, 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 and realize... Um, that your horror at that is 100% because you believe that that child has a soul and has value and bears the image of God, and they don't. And, 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 the, and, the, and they, in fact, they don't even consider it's getting worse and worse because once you start on that slippery slope, it just gets worse and worse and worse. Now what they're saying is that even a term child has no rights where the woman has rights. So her right to murder her own child is greater than the child because the child isn't born yet and doesn't have that right. So there's no inherent value in the child. After all, because she's she or he is made in the image of nothing, right? So I Jews, the same thinking about slaves. They didn't have any value, or they didn't have any value either. And well, that's why, you know, because a lot of people say, well, how could this Holocaust go on? How could slavery go on? How could that even happen? And well, I understand how it happened, but these people, even, even in the churches, Germany, how it, it went on, it was then it was lawful. There's talks about where there would be churches singing and the trains would be going by with screaming and they would say, Sing a little louder. Well, well keep that in perspective. We, we must keep everything in perspective. And I'm going to use a story to tell that story, okay, because it's the same thing. The United Methodist Church just held a big conference, as we've talked about here before. And it is all about coming out, about ordaining um, same-sex marriage, homosexuality, LGBTQ+. It is all about in bringing this in to the church. And you see this massive, very well-publicized conference that they had to celebrate it, people crying and weeping because finally, you know, now they're validated in their, in, in, in their uh, beliefs and, and everything is great. And so people look at that and say, what on earth happened to the United Methodist Church? Well, close to 8,000 churches had already split before that happened. So in other words, 8,000 full churches said, no, oh, we're not going to have anything to do with this. That's not biblical. So they split. Okay, So they, you don't hear about that. You hear about, oh, the Methodists are all for gays. Well, all the conservative Methodists have left. So the German church embraced Arianism, okay, Arian supremacy, and, and Hitler's um, uh, 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 hatred of the Jews. But the Lutheran church is gone by that time. Okay? They've gone underground. They're, they're not the ones there. The Lutheran church, the, the, the higher ups, of course, was very close to being apostate anyway at the time. 
but you still had people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer who was there. But the, the, the Lutheran church, by the most part, had, had already been uh, devoid of those who were going to stand up against Hitler. So it's not like good Christians who are sitting there worshiping and, and they're just saying, you know, uh, sing louder uh, because uh, of the Holocaust. They actually embraced. You can have pictures of the, of the bishops and the, the heads of the Lutheran church, even some of the, uh, the Roman Catholic diocese doing the Heil Hitler thing. Okay, I mean, they gave in, they caved, and you see what happens to those who didn't cave, Bonhoeffer, a, 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 an enemy of the state, maliciously killed two weeks before Hitler killed himself, just to eliminate all those political enemies, kill all the enemies that, um, that dared to stand against me. And he didn't even do that, he just refused to, to bend to, to Hitler. So, you know, it's, it's not the, uh, the, the church. But let me back up and, and answer part of your question about abortion and about the fact that there doesn't seem to be a national consciousness of it. Um, I had a woman stop me um, after uh, the service uh, several weeks ago. And... Um, uh, the, the error that people accept is because they've been taught. They've been taught that I don't really have an opinion on it. I can go left or right on it. But I've been taught that this is not really a life. It's just a growth on the woman's womb. Okay? I mean, roll your eyes, but that's what they've been taught, right? Right? And so they accept it, and that's done. I don't have to think about that anymore. And I see all these crazy pictures of people and, and the evidence. I don't have to worry about that because that, I've decided that issue, and it's already done. It's out of my head. Okay? And, and so even, even later on, if you're taught now, they couldn't get away with that argument anymore. So now the argument is that there is some inherent right in the woman that she has that makes it okay to destroy knowingly a life. That would have never flown 40 years ago. Back when the, the wart on the, uh, uh, on the inside of a womb argument was being made. Okay, If you came out and said, no, we're going to go for late-term abortion, and it's the woman's right, no, even the abortionist wouldn't have allowed that. But you see, once you keep drilling in, this is the truth. And people who are not interested in the truth, they just want it to go away. They just don't want to think about it. It doesn't affect me. It doesn't bother me. I don't see it. It's not on my doorstep. I'm not seeing the broken lives. I'm not seeing the products of this. Okay? I can go on with my life. And all you need to do is give me a comfortable place to hang my hat. And so you hang your hat on choice, good, it's done. So there's no consciousness because of that. Yes, sir. Did they go have a second fail like after a um, thousand years when then we get some people get saved if it's a fairy tale? And my second one, in Revelation 21, Jesus coming with a white horse. That's when they go and have animals saved in the heaven, but pretty sure dog, not cat. So, I don't have no choice. comes out on a white horse, does that mean that, that proves that there are animals in heaven, but only dogs and certainly not cats? Okay? Um, I, I don't know. I, I have learned that all dogs go to heaven. I, I, I have learned that. Uh, what was your first question? Uh, I, I missed that. Very tell. This is after a thousand, uh, after we uh, spend a thousand years with Christ. And they have people who fell again, like 
uh, and um, go and rebel against God right. again. Right. Those, those people never get saved or what? Uh, well, uh, um, that is um, uh, probably one of the most contested areas of scripture that divides evangelicals who even evangelicals who believe in the sovereignty of God. It, it, the way that we interpret the millennia, the thousand year reign of Christ, is very problematic. And it's the the most apocalyptic symbolic book in the Bible. And um, the way that you interpret it is usually the way that you're going to come up with what that means. For instance, I don't believe that there's going to be that thousand year reign and then there's going to be a rapture of all the Gentile church and then there's going to be a reign where Jesus is in control and then there's going to be another great tribulation that is going to lead to the, the end. There are so many ideas about that, but when I read Revelation, and I, I, I preached on it uh, years ago, but when I read Revelation, I see that virtually every number in Revelation is symbolic. Almost every number. And, and when I preached, when I taught Revelation, I said, okay, we're going to have to make a decision right here and now, the very beginning of the book. We're going to have to make a decision on how we are going to interpret things. Because if we're going to interpret them literally, then we're going to have to interpret the whole book literally. But if you're going to interpret it symbolically, you're going to have to interpret the whole book symbolically. You can't switch back and forth when it suits you. Okay? Now, people who go look for a literal thousand-year reign of Christ, they're taking that thousand years, and they're saying, well, I, I, I don't think he, there was actually a door in heaven. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure that, you know, the, 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 these locusts that are going to come out of, of hell and attack the world, um, yeah, that's quite symbolic. That's uh, symbolic of this or that. The Whore of Babylon is symbolic of the culture. More than willing to say all those kinds of things, but when it gets to the thousand-year reign, no, 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 that's an actual thousand years that's going to happen, and Jesus is going to come back, he's going to reign on earth, and there's going to be a great tribulation. Me, I think we're in the thousand years. The gospel age. The age that the church, the church age. We are the body of Christ. So I, re I read that as being com a completely symbolic number, okay? So I, I don't, I, I, I can't get into, now again, some, some scholars that I deeply respect who are much smarter than I am would completely tear me apart on that argument because they, they look at it differently and they have carefully studied scripture and they see it one way and I've carefully studied it, and I see it another way. And we're talking about the most apocalyptic book. Apocalyptic literature is literature that's not supposed to tell you ABC what's happening. It actually is supposed to create an image in your mind. That's what the literature is for. So I, 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 I don't see that. There's lots of problems in, in trying to follow through Revelation linearly and to in, in, interpret all those words, all, all those, those times, those numbers in a literal basis. Because guess what? If you do it literally, I, I think, which is what the Jehovah's Witnesses do, that there's only 440,000 people who are going to be saved. Or 1,440, what, whatever the number is, in, in six or seven. Uh, 144,000, yeah. There's only 144,000, 12 times 12, that's what it is. Um, who are going to be saved, because you've got to take that one literally, right? So that's what the Jehovah's Witnesses work their whole lives and think that, well, I'm probably not one of that 144,000, because only 144,000 are going to be saved. So you can't take the thousand-year reign literally and then take the 144,000 uh, uh, um, symbolically. Got to be consistent. Yes, ma'am, Miss Candy. 
said that you think that we're in the, the um, thousand year reign. Uh, do you feel that that began in the book of Acts? Um, when your faith began, uh, let me just put it this way. I believe that the thousand year reign began with the cosmic initiative. I believe that Jesus came to earth as a king. Now, whether that was at the carnation, whether that was at his baptism, whether that was at his resurrection, whether that was at his ascension and coronation, which I would mean more so than at Pentecost, I can't tell you because I don't think scripture gives us that definitive. I mean, it's in that block of time that we call the first advent when Jesus came to earth to establish the kingdom of God, All right? Now, if I were to look at it entirely as the church age, the age of the gospel, then I would start at Pentecost. Okay. Well, if you, again, if you go to the book of Revelation and you start looking at numbers that talk about the extent of the gospel age, you start getting numbers like... Uh, times, times, and half a time, or three and a half years, or the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70-week prophecy, 42 months, 1,240 days. And when you look at those numbers, they all calculate to the exact same number of days. So in very different ways, we are being told that this stretch of time which is really the last week of Daniel's 70 week, is the extended time of the, of the gospel age, the church age, the age in which we live. So I, I, I think that there's more than just a few numbers that represent this, and I think that a thousand year, even though it's not of the same genre as the other, I think that's what the thousand year reign means because that's 10 times 10, uh, in which is you know, not ten times ten, obviously ten times ten times ten. So the, the cubing of, of a of a number of completion. So it's the the actual number of days that it will be until we start looking at the second coming. And, and once again, we are told you don't need to worry about that. You don't need to be calculating things out. You know, um, you just need to be doing what the Lord has called you to do and to be ready when He comes. Well, the rapture, um, actually, and I forget her name, but it was a 15-year-old prophetess girl who saw it in a vision, and she developed the, the, the idea of the Gentile rapture, and that was when that whole thing, then guys like Darby and Schofield, they picked it up, and they fit into their teaching because they were dispensationalist. They were not covenantal in the way they saw church history or religious history. They saw it in specific dispensations. And so her vision of the rapture fit in perfectly with what they were already teaching. So they just jumped on it with both feet. But yeah, that, that's only been 200. Yeah, yeah, it, it was in the 1800s somewhere. So it's only been a couple hundred years that that whole idea has been about. Now, of course... They deny that. They can go back and find obscure statements in their early church fathers and say, aha, that's what he was talking about, which, of course, is a, a problem that happens all the time, people writing, reading into something, something that wasn't there. Okay. Um, that is another one of those um, morasses, uh, as, as Sonia says, um, rabbit pits rabbit holes, ra rabbit folly, going down a rabbit pit um, that we can go into and we have a hard time getting out. Um, because there, there's no, there, it's just simply not absolutely clear in Scripture what the Holy Spirit meant by it. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm reading in Hebrews 7, the order of Melchizedek. Uh -huh. And I was looking forward to when Jesus but the high priest he is, mm -hmm. because he's an eternal, an eternal priesthood. Mm -hmm. So 
that kind of talks in with what you talked about when the veil was torn when Jesus died. But this was way back. It's so amazing that this is way, way back in Abraham's time, mm -hmm. looking forward to Jesus. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, in, more, in more ways than one. Um, Melchizedek is a very interesting figure, and what the writer of Hebrews points out about Melchizedek is that he came from nowhere. Yeah. Uh, he just appears, and Abraham, who, according to Jewish thought, literally carried Christ in his voice, um, was the, 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 the one who paid tribute to Melchizedek. All right? um, now, he also was the prince of Salem, which was Jer Jerusalem. Okay, so that's the, and, and it was on his trip back, going right by there from getting, uh, you know, taking care of Ketelamer, I think was what it was. And he came back, and uh, all of a sudden, here comes Melchizedek out. So the, the purpose of Melchizedek in Hebrews, though, is to get around the fact that Jesus was of the tribe of David. And God indicated that all his priests would be from the Aaronic um, priesthood, from the, the Levites would, would all be these priests. And so this was a way for him to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek, because Melchizedek is a priest, because Abraham paid him a duty, and also a king, but same thing, king and priest. So very interesting um, discussion. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the mysteries of, of, the, of the church, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it, basically, was he a Christophany? Um, well, Christophany is a per, perhaps a, an appearance of the second member of the Godhead in some human form outside of the incarnation. So was he, and when, sometimes when the angel of the Lord is referred to in the Old Testament, is that Christ in a Christophany? We don't know. That's, that, that's con conjecture. Um, that's, where, that's why we want to go to that video room in heaven and uh, we get to watch all the video clips of, of history and see what uh, actually happened. Wouldn't it be cool if that was like we, we, that we're two-dimensional and actually rather than, than um, watching a two-dimensional screen that what you did is transported there, you got to actually go there and be part of it, you know? course not killed in the battles we, we wouldn't want that but you know I mean who knows what what glories maybe they're, they're, they're too painful and that, that would cause us sorrow so we won't see it at all but we have a lot of questions I, I would like to be answered okay any more questions good uh, good, good good discussion um, on this I'm gonna let you go um, it's 10 minutes early but we started 10 minutes early so I'll let you um, uh, go. Um, um, next week, we have a real treat for you. Um, uh, Pastor Jeff Day uh, will be here, uh, I hope. Um, uh, he's supposed to be here. Um, and we're going to see our team off uh, going to um, Kentucky. They're all ready to go. In fact, Ms. Sherry, if you would just hang on for a half a second, I, I want to ask you something. All right, let me pray, and I'll let you guys go. Heavenly Father, um, Going back to the mystery, and, and, and I'll just call it a mystery because we don't fully understand it, but the mystery of being made in your image and yet at the same time being fallen. The whole idea of the dignity of having your image, but then the depravity of having every aspect of our being having fallen, the total depravity concept. Um, we, we, we love the fact that you do open it up for us to a degree. But if there's anything that I, I know that we are to be involved with, and that is the restoration in ourselves and in our church and in the world of the Imago Dei and the way that we act and the way that we do. So once again, I just ask that, that beautiful picture of the church searching and, 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 and having the, the lamp that works through it and the and the broom looking for those lost coins. Lord, we would love to be a part of that in this world in any way that you see fit to use us. 
Thank you for these people. Give them safe travel as they go home. We give you the glory in Christ's name. Amen. Amen and amen, and God bless you guys.